big press on it and pull your wheels. Hopefully your wheels are, aren't stuck. Um, these are in pretty clean shape. Okay. Next step is to remove the lower rear shock mounts, shock mount bolts. Don't forget the other side. So go ahead and loosen the mid-drive. I like to use this aluminum flat bar. It's one inch by quarter inch or three sixteenths, something like that. And uh, because it's aluminum, it's softer than the steel of the axle. So when you go banging on it, it's not gonna put a dent in the axle and make it difficult to remove the bearing. So you can try the block in various space, spaces to give you room to pull the axle. Uh, this seems to work pretty well, but you got various options. Axle support stand that we've had for years. It's a great little shop tool to have for disassembling axles. In this case, it's going to knock these center bearings out. This is a Wagner paint eater. Um, it uses these pads that are basically like a really stiff scotch bright. It's not required, but we go ahead and use this to uh, buff any corrosion or rough spots off of the axle. And that just helps uh, your future work on the bike tremendously. Uh, the bolts, the four inch bolts that go through them with five inch bolts. The um, springs and spacers need to be in place on the differential bolts if you're using a single piston rear caliper like most Main Streets come with. That pr allows a little bit of float and improves braking performance. So the springs allow the, the rotor to float just a little bit. So first thing is just loosen up the bolt. So this is the old bolt. It's a, a special custom bolt that has an extra long thread to it. And it has a flange uh, on the end here. Um, so we're gonna take off the, the spacer and the spring and put it on to the new five inch bolt. We want to go ahead and put in a washer in there first to act as the flange. And then we'll go ahead and insert it into the axle. And we want to make sure that you have this little spring action here on the bolt, which indicates that the spacer is not hung up on the disc. So it, if the disc gets a little bit out of whack or out of, out of alignment, then it will allow the spacer to get hung up and then you lose your float action. So I've got these uh, 5 8 spacers here. They fit on like that. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do the rest of them. And then this bolt here, these two shorter bolts are going to stay in place and we'll just won't bother with them. On the opposite side we've got the four 5 8 spacers. I'm going to go ahead and put in the sprocket here. And then I'm going to double check and make sure my spacers are inserted into the holes in the disc side. Make sure they're going to allow the disc to float before I tighten everything down. So inspecting the axle here before we put it back in the bike, again I've got the smooth running differential, everything's counter rotating easily. I've got my uh, disc, it's able to spring, feel the float, spacers in place, there's four of them, and the motor sprocket are ready to install on the bike. Installing the axle is a little tricky, but you know, lift 
things in place here. You can flex your fiberglass out of the way. So there's a lot of grease left over on these bearings that help them uh, spin around inside the flangettes. That's good, but it never hurts to add a little bit extra. And then put some on the inside of each bearing to act as a water seal to keep rust out. And then when you're putting the bearing in on the inner one, you're going to mount it basically here. And on the outer one, you're going to mount it here. Um, these are the two crossbar support plates. This is your crossbar. Here's your crossbar support clamp. It attaches here like this. Your motor cradles, their clamps, spring-loaded chain tensioner, anchor hardware, and so forth. Um, into the holes. And then you have these plates. And typically, you're going to use these two holes right here. So that the axle su support plate points all the way forward. Now, you can have, there's a right side and a left side on these guys. And it doesn't really matter which is which unless you're running into clearance issues. Uh, sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. These two axle support plates vary in distance from one make to the next. They're not all the same. So uh, you may have to play around with it if, if it runs in, if you run into clearance problems. Typically, I'll go ahead and put the clamp on the outside. Hard to get kind of a wrench in here. It's a little bit harder to get it in here. You can do it, but um, you know, sometimes you run into clearance issues. So to simplify later work, uh, we're gonna go ahead and s swap these bolt heads around to have the, the carriage square hex head uh, engage on the uh, axle support plate side like this. And that'll make it a lot easier to work on it in the future. So we've got the bearing bearings in place, the act the crossbar support plates in place. We've got the bearing noses pointed inward towards this section of the axle on both sides. And we have some free spin, so that's looking pretty good. Alright, next step, go ahead and retighten the chain on the midship. Get it snugged up. So real easy, we got this clamp here. It's gonna go right here with a little nut and washer or bolt and washer. Looking something like that. So this is your Cyclone uh, 2000 to 4000 watt motor. Typically they don't get that many watts, but they are rated to carry a lot of power and heat and are thus less likely to overheat. So I'm gonna loosen, leave this one snug, loosen these three, and we're gonna put this in where the mouth of the cradle, motor cradle is opposite of the pigtail. So I'm going to grease up these four screws, very important. Get them well lubricated as these get adjusted a good bit when you're getting everything dialed in.
next thing is to make sure you get your sprocket on your motor lined up with the sprocket on your axle. And to me, it looks like this needs to go this way. But uh, to double check, I'm going to go ahead and get a straight edge, like a ruler, uh, and use it to gauge how close or how far off I am. So in this case, it looks like it needs to scoot over about an eighth of an inch. I've just got this pressed against the sprocket here, and that should tell us exactly where the motor freewheel should line up. Rock it back and forth, pull it towards you. And there, I pulled it too much, so we're about a quarter inch off. And so I'll do the same thing going in the opposite direction. Get it lined up, about like so, until it's uh, spot on there. And that'll ensure your chain uh, rides straight and is less likely to fall off. Some heavy duty chain. KMC 710H, uh, KMC 510H works really well. It's kind of my favorite, but it's hard to get right now. The KMC 410 works fine. The idea here is that we're going to go ahead and check the length. And lay it over the sprocket about midway. Like that. And then I'll go ahead and draw it in. In this case, we'll need a half length and a master length to get it to the correct size. And that'll be right about here. And what I'm looking for is that when I press down on the chain, it's not touching on the crossbar. And I can adjust the motor position to give a little more clearance, I'm trying to get this nose here in the middle of the two pedal chain runs, up and lower and upper. And then we got plenty of clearance over here on this side. We'll play with this as we go along. I've got the half link in. I've got the master link in my hand. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this around this motor sprocket, engage the axle sprocket. So I'm going to go ahead and set the motor position where I want it to stay. And I'm looking at the bottom, which is going to be hard to tell from the camera point of view, and the top, or this would be the top here, and this would be the bottom. Uh, I'm trying to make, split the difference, make sure I have equal amount of clearance on each. It doesn't really matter as long as you have clearance. But And then I'm looking at the position of the nose, make sure it's not tangling with the pedal chain. And, um, and just kind of eyeballing it, make sure it looks good. Might drop it a little bit lower. And then I'm gonna go ahead and tighten down these clamps. We might have to adjust them again. Okay, the next step is to go ahead and put the chain tensioner in place. To hold the chain snug as it stretches. The first step is to go ahead and take this spring out of the thing so this chain will be able to, this tensioner will be able to swing freely. And then you're going to take this pin and put it in that little hole right below the, the threaded hole. And then I'm going to start threading this guy in. It helps to have a bondus type Allen to get at this a little better. All right, you want to make sure you got free movement, and then you want to drop a little bit of lube on there, on that pivot right here, to ensure that it stays moving freely over time. Okay. And then, you go ahead and engage the spring, put it back in the hole where it came from. So you loosen this four millimeter Allen here and slide this over till it centers on the chain. Kind of pivot it up 
tighten it down, keep it in the same spot, get it real good and tight. This screw likes to fall out sometimes, and that's a bad thing when it does. And then there, you're going to be have constant chain tension on there. All right, so putting in the turnbuckle, we've got a bunch of washers here that we're using as spacers to keep this clear, keep the turnbuckle here clear of the chain tensioner. And they're just quarter inch washers commonly available. If you find yourself needing some more, you can add some more. Like the main thing here is to make sure this and this don't collide. Okay. So ideally, you can set this uh, into this hole right here, furthest away from the position of the, um, the pivot point of the motor. And the greater distance will give it a little more uh, mechanical advantage to hold its position more, more better. And then I, the ideal here is that we have the turnbuckle coming out straight from the motor and that's not cocked at a funny angle that would make it difficult to adjust. So I'm going to grab some more, some more quarter inch washers. Alright, so that completes the mechanical assembly of the motor uh, and axle. Um, we've got everything bolted in place. We've got pretty good free spin. Might have to adjust the axle right to the left a little bit because we've got a little bit of brake, lub, brake rub. Um, no big deal there, but we can see the chain is snug, the chain's not rubbing, motor's locked in place, everything's snugged up, everything's lined up, and uh, at this point we're ready to do the electrical assembly, install the controller, throttle, and uh, battery cable. Alright, thank you. I like to mount the controller kind of halfway underneath this bar so they have two bolts here and a bolt here. I'll usually use just three bolts and I'm drilling a quarter inch hole through the fiberglass and the foot well and the uh, <coughs> flange of the controller. That way I can slip a bolt in from the bottom. Okay, so I've got the one bolt in at the end now I'm going to do one, two more. And I've been holding on the, keeping, keeping all the cables back with my hand. I'll swing this aside, make sure we got all the way through all the rubber. And then I'll take a fender washer and a smaller bolt here. This is like a 1024. I'll slip it in from the bottom. The main things we have to look out at on the controller here are the phase wires, which are these big colorful connectors here. Green, blue, white. The hall wires. Phase wires is power to the motor. Hall wires is communication with the motor. And they plug in, of course, to the other phase wires with corresponding colors. We got a throttle in here, a power switch, which is this guy, and there all the cables are marked pretty nicely. And then we got the battery cable, and the battery cable is going to plug here as well so that we can measure the voltage of the battery. So if you look real closely inside this connector, uh, the blue one here, there is a metal contact, and that metal contact is slipped back away from its uh, position, and that will prevent the motor from working properly. So it's a good idea to just double check these connectors, make sure they're all in place. So the green's in place, and the white's in place, but the blue is not. So it's as simple as just getting a tool and pushing the blue one to lock in place until you hear it so you hear it click, 
where you can't pull it out. In this case, it's locked in. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug in blue phase. And when you when they contact, they should you should hear this get a physical feel of the connector coming metal to metal and then you should hear it click as well. And if you don't hear that click or feel that physical connection, then something is wrong. All right, so those are all there. And then you're, you got your hall wires and there's a, a little tang on one side and there's a, over here there's a little clip. Press the clip, line up the clip and tang. They go together and then we'll zip tie this to the box, to the controller. And then these other wires, we're going to bag everything that we're not going to use. So we'll keep the throttle out and the battery cable out. And the power wire, the power switch out. But all these other ones, the PAS and brake and reverse and whatnot, we're just going to bundle those together, fold them in half, stick them in a plastic bag and pretend they don't exist. All right, and double check to make sure you got your battery, your switch, your throttle, your phase, and your hulls all exposed and ready to plug in. And all this other stuff we're not gonna use. And then we'll get this all buttoned down and zip tied nice and snug to hold it in place. All right, so I'm trying to flatten things out a little bit, get it to be, you know, snugly out of the way. Make sure we got plenty of clearance around the chain. We don't have anything dangling down that someone could trip on. And then we're left with these three important ones, throttle, power switch, and battery. So, pop the hole in the fiberglass bucket. The uh, Andersons here are gonna slip through that hole and then we'll put the Anderson connector in place over it and it'll be red to positive, black to negative, always that way. And we have a couple of pieces of heat shrink on the cable to help protect the cable from chafing. You don't really have to worry about shrinking it. And then we have this, uh, typically we'll have one of these extra small PP45, Anderson PowerPole 45 connectors, which you can plug into a power inverter to run, uh, you know, like your 12 volt to 48 volt to 12 volt lighting, or 48 to 12 volt step down converter, which you can use to run your lights. Anyway, here's the battery getting plugged in. Okay, then we'll find some nice, places to wrap some zip ties to route that. And of course here we got our little power sense wire. And the only thing we got left here now is the throttle and the power switch. We'll zip it, zip everything down and clean it up. As I mentioned before, uh, you got your Anderson power pole SB50 connector. It's gonna slip in here and it's only goes in one way with this connect the uh, contactor contactor has a little metal lip that um, needs to hit this little spring plate and that spring plate will clip into the lip and hold it in place so I kind of find feel it for the slot it's like a rectangular slot that this contactor will fit into and then you hear that second click 
that was the Anderson uh, contactor hitting the, the spring clip. So I'm trying to get this rotated correctly. Okay, I think that's it. There it goes. And that, I'm inspecting it, pulling on it, making sure everything's where it should be. And we got this little piece of heat shrink here, which will you can uh, shrink shrink down at this point with a heat gun. Right, getting the grip off is pretty easy. I like to slip a tool in there. This bondage driver works good, but you can use a flat blade or Phillips or whatever. Drip a little. Uh, rubbing alcohol in there and that loosens up the grip nicely it pops right off and then we use a it's either a two and a half or a three to go ahead and remove the uh, shift uh, if you have one of these uh, grip shifters it's going to get in the way of your throttle so I'll replace the grip shift with this guy the thumb shifter that will give you room for all your stuff to fit in and I'm going to try to arrange it in such a way that like, I can make sure this shifter has full swing to be able to shift the front derailleur. And the derailleur and the brake lever has ability to clamp all the way. So maybe something like this and I'll set it back a little ways and scoot these down a little bit. And then try to make sure I have enough space over here to fit a hand comfortably. Okay. So I've got it where you can look over here and see the voltage of the of the of your battery. Um, and the key is pointed down. I'll put a zip a zip tie to hold the key in place so it doesn't like actually fall out. But uh you know, sometimes you just got to like compromise. I would love to have it over here on the left side, but this brake lever precludes fitting it, as does this twist shifter. So, to make it work as best we can, we're going to swap out this shifter. The throttle cable here, which has two connectors on it. Red, green, black for throttle. Blue, yellow for the power switch, which is this key here. All right, so I'll run it, I generally run it along the top tube, on the bottom of the top tube. And I'll zip tie it to the cable that's already there. And then I'll check the swing of the fork to make sure the fork is not going to cut the cable and pin, uh, pinch the cable and cut it. So that's important to keep in mind as you uh, zip tie everything down into place. So this is the shifter. We're gonna go ahead and install this cable, little shift cable. And then we're gonna take a piece of this housing that we have here. And sometimes you can reuse the old housing, but generally because of the way the old housing ran, doesn't wanna, won't wanna fit this new style shifter. So just check your length here. You know, something kind of like that. Give it a little bit extra. Uh, on plumbing also works real well for cutting grips. So I've got this little bushing here, which needs to go in next to the throttle, and that keeps your throttle from getting stuck on your grip and locking and making bad things happen. So I'm gonna mark it somewhere like this. Just 
Fire it up. Chop it. A little more rubbing alcohol. Slip it on there. That should harden up nice. I'm gonna run a couple more zip ties through here to hold this in place. And I'm gonna tuck this cable underneath the little piece of angle bracket. Up a little spots where there's already zip ties that I can slide underneath just to use those. We have just enough cable here to plug into the power switch and the throttle. And once we plug a battery in, this should be good to go. I'll finish zip tying it, clean it up, making sure everything's tucked out of the way so there's nothing going to get tangled with your feet or with trip on a passenger or tangled with your chain. And nothing that's gonna wiggle or waggle or cause some damage that might, from vibration. Plugged it in, cleaned it up. Um, I've got voltage reading on the handlebar here showing 56.7 volts off the battery. And of course has to be turned on. Uh, hit the throttle. Good to go.